Bullied as a child through to a life of football hooliganism, robbery, alcoholism and drug addiction. Graham Seed now runs Sowing Seed Ministries, where he hopes to help prisoners and ex-offenders find faith. Straight away I had a, a, a criminal record, you know, I was introduced to the police for shoplifting and breaking into schools and youth clubs and getting arrested in my house and then someone died when I was 15 and the police came and arrested me and accused me of his murder and 16 year old I ended up going to prison for breaking into schools and youth clubs and I had my first taste of jail. I got out of the Medmsey Detention Centre when I was 16 and um, I was sick of being a skinhead really and quite bored of what we were doing and we were thinking there must be something else you know going on and it was kind of a strange thing happened. We were in a pub one night on a Saturday night and this lad, these lads came in, quite a few of them. They had already been fighting at the train station. And the pub was right next to the train station. It's been knocked down now, and um, the pub. And these lads came in with tracksuits on and caps and they started talking about um, where they'd been and what they'd been doing. They seemed like they were dead, dead happy, you know. They were like buzzing type of thing, you know. And um, they came and sat with us and knew us. We we knew them from the town. I knew loads of them from the estates and that, you know. And anyway, they came and sat with us and they were talking to us and they were telling us about the the bit of a football match and the, the the bit of a bonus was watching the match. But the biggest thing they went for was to fight with these other firms. And we start asking them what what gangs are where and they were telling us about the inner city firm and Chelsea Edmonds and the, you know all the other other firms and stuff like that and my friend said my eyes were like saucers because they were telling us how many people there was like hundreds of people there and hundreds of people at these matches and stuff like that and I just felt that this was an exciting life you know so I I, I went to my first football match got involved with it I was only there four months I ended up in Barcelona myself got out of Barcelona, went straight back to the football scene. You know, if you go come out of prison and you go back to that situation, it's it's not easy to, to not get into trouble, you know. It's not easy to go the way they're going. And um but I've had a number of amount of injuries, you know, first one as I said the cut across my eye, I've been it over the head with like a sword, I had a bit of my chin took away. I've had a bottle in both eyes, I've had my little finger chopped off. I've had my arm ripped open, I've been stabbed in the arm and chest four times, I've got no front teeth. And um, I've had both my arms pulled out the sockets. So there's not only the injuries and the prison sentences, but I was kind of blinded by the um, the so-called um, adrenaline and so-called hype that went with it. So I, I was with them about on and off about a decade, but in and out of prison and... And when I left the football scene, I was actually in jail. And when I made, I was 1989, I'd gone back to prison and I was now really determined that I was never going to go back to jail again. And I really was determined this time. I, I know I'd said it before, but I was so sick of this lifestyle. So what I did is I um, got a job as a doorman. I was a big man, you know, big, strong, athletic looking man, you know. So getting a job on the door was no issue. And so I worked over the Christmas of 1990 and um, New Year's Eve of 1990 to 1991. Uh, a fight broke out in the pub and I had an undercover policeman. And uh, I was arrested, bailed, came back to Middlesbrough, went back to court and was sentenced to two years. I went to a jail called Armley in Leeds and I spent 13 months in there, but. To be honest, that jail sentence was, I had a, must have had a major breakdown, no, sorry, a mini breakdown because I wouldn't come out myself. I, I didn't want to know anything, you know, just, just, just not wanting to live really, you know. And uh, but when I got out, those the dark days were coming even worse than that, really. Um, I tried to fit in again, as I said, when I come back to Middlesbrough, I was trying my hardest for the safe six months to try and get back to 
to the life I used to have, you know, try and be happy and try and meet people who were who I knew and uh people had settled down, pubs names had changed, landlords had changed and it wasn't the same and I often say I was deceived because I must have thought I could have been 15 again but I was 29 year old, well just nearly 29 and I found a bench in the town centre in Middlesbrough uh, on, a, on a road called Grange Road, it was a red light district where the girls stood on a night and they basically stood there to get drug money, you know, for and the boyfriends were pimping for them. And I sat amongst them all and drinking and listening to music on the street and just trying to drown this life out, you know. I cut my wrists, my own wrists, you know, there. Scars are there, look, I don't know if you can see them. I cut my own wrists and the police found me at three o'clock in the morning um, in a pool of blood because I did it when no one was around. I, I meant business, you know. I woke up in hospital, Sam, I sat out of hospital, went back to the bench and drank again and and the drink wasn't enough to get rid of these thoughts and so I started taking heroin. Firstly I started, we call it tooting heroin where you, it's like chasing a dragon basically on a piece of foil and I was tooting heroin and I was injecting it now and again and drinking extreme amounts of drink, not caring, didn't eat much. And by 1996, March, I was a, a tramp. 1995 Christmas Day was probably the lowest day I've ever, ever had in my life so far. I, I woke up on the floor outside the post office. I knew it was Christmas Day. I'd had a good score the night before, meaning I'd been begging because it was Christmas Eve. I must have had two or three hundred quid in my pocket because I knew lots of people in Middlesbrough. Lots of people would give me pound coins and two pound coins and the odd fiver and got the odd tenner. Um, but I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk, I was ill and there was no shops open. So I crawled on my hands and knees through our town centre, which to the shop was about maybe a quarter of a mile away. And I crawled on my hands and knees to the only Asian shop. I knew that I'd be open over the border. And when I got to the shop, I got myself a, a two litre bottle of white lightning and a bottle of vodka and some orange. And I sat outside drinking that. But as I sat there, I watched kids on the bikes, you know. Um, I feel emotional now talking about it, but I, I was reminiscing about when I was a little boy, you know, and where it all began. And to be honest, uh, Harvey, I just wanted to die there and then. That year, I went into a coma. I was in a coma for six days and my mother was called to the hospital. Yeah, my stepdad went to the hospital on the sixth day and they were invited into the consultant's room and he gave them, my mum, the forms to sign to turn the machine off, the ventilator machine that was keeping me alive. And my mum said uh, she didn't know what to do. She was, she was confused because she'd seen me in the bed and seen how ill I was but didn't really know what to do. And my mum will tell you that she, she, some people said, look, you're doing him a favour by turning the machine off. You know, he's living in hell on earth. You know, he's got no hope, he's, he's an addict. And you're doing him a favour, turn it off. Some said he's a waste of space. And yet quite a lot of people came, including my best friend Tony. And his wife Haley had said, um, look, you've got to fight for him, you've got to keep fighting, and the wards was you've got to keep fighting for him. And my mum said to the consultant, well, I don't know what to do, so we wait a couple of more hours. And there's some Christian men, Peter and Aidan and Nicky came, who tried to tell me on the streets about Jesus, you know. And they came to the hospital and prayed for me, and I woke up out of this coma that they said I was dead. And right from the beginning, I knew there was something different about me. Uh, so in Seeds Ministries, we, our aim is to see people find that word hope and we go into prison or a church and share my story to, to let people come in and see that Christians haven't got two heads and Christians do care, you know what I mean? And 
Because the first thing you think of about church, I don't know about you, but for me, was, oh, God's just a, a man with a stick who wants to control you, you know, and, you know, they, they know not about you and all that, you know. So I've go to places and bring that element where we do know what you talk, we do know what you need, we do know how to, if we can help you, we will, because I have been there and done it, you know.